Uh, good evening. The curriculum committee for the public schools of Robertson County is now in session. Uh, Mr. Randy Lawson is taking John's place tonight, and so he's operating the machinery. If it squeaks, it doesn't work, it's, it's Mr. Lawson's fault. And being that, Mr. Lawson will do our invocation. Let us pray. Dear gracious, kind Heavenly Father, thank you once again for letting us come together, dear Heavenly Father, and discuss things about public schools, Robson County, and our children, dear God. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for your mercy, grace, and love. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you lead and guide us in our hearts and our minds tonight during this curriculum meeting. Dear Heavenly Father, that everything would be about your will, dear Heavenly Father. We ask this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Um, I feel like it's important to say the task of what the curriculum committee is supposed to be doing. And it is, we get together with the staff and we discuss curriculum issues, curriculum initiatives, and we bring back those ideas to the full board, be it in informational handouts or just presentations. So um, this is the purpose of why we're here is to share and get ready to prepare materials for the full board. Um, I want to do it this way if you allow me. Um, I want a motion to accept this agenda. And it should be only with the, I'm sorry, I love all of you, but just those committee members can vote on this. And those committee members are Henry Brewer, John Simmons, William Gentry, and Mike Smith. And we have most of them absent. So I'm gonna ask the committee, will you make a motion, Henry Brewer, some of you to, and then we'll vote those of us that are here. Madam Chair, I, uh, I make a motion that we accept the uh, curriculum committee meeting agenda for January 31, 2023 as listed. I don't know, is it appropriate for me to second because we have so many members that are not here? I don't know. Can I second? Okay, I second. And if there's any objection, I'll take a second from one of the members that are not on the committee. Would somebody second it's not on the committee in case I can put it? Okay, Mrs. Trey Britt seconds it, thank you. Um, and I also wanna welcome those that are participating or listening remotely tonight. We, we appreciate your interest in these items. We ask, we are asking the presenters to be precise and brief because I've already been approached by two that said they had prior appointments and they had some place to go, but they would love to go through the entire agenda. Just remember the whole purpose is to lay out information for the full board and I appreciate it. We do want to spend some time with the presentation from the school that you have on here, but we appreciate all your information. Just if you would be precise and brief and we shall begin. Let me say good afternoon or good evening to everyone, to Dr. Williamson, Dr. Emanuel, other board members. That's it. So I was asked to, to just give you a, uh, I guess a briefing about the new career center programs. Uh, and of course it's, it was said from the very beginning that we will be taking the current programs that we have at the current career center to the new school. So with that, just so that you have a, a feel for all of those programs, we have automotive service, we have welding, the computer engineering, network engineering, drafting engineering, uh, the Adobe design and video, uh, the EMT program, emergency medical technology, carpentry, electrical, masonry, and plumbing. And if I may say, with carpentry, electrical, masonry, and plumbing, that forms our construction academy. And uh, 
the information that we received from um, my future NC deemed that the, the Robinson County and surrounding counties are in the construction zone for the high need for job performances. So we see that we're right on target with that. Um, some other programs with the computer engineering and network engineering, those students will be now taking those two courses and then they will be able to test for a cybersecurity uh, certification in that. New programs, and we're real excited about this, uh, new programs that we will be adding is the drone technology. And I, I don't know if we have drones delivering food in Lumberton yet or not, but in your metropolitan areas, they do. Uh, so that's just one thing that they do. Don't have to do DoorDash all the time. Have the drone drop it off at your front door. And then, of course, um, culinary arts. We felt that this would give um, across the board all students throughout the district to have a chance to take a full culinary art program. Due to facilities, we were not able to have a full culinary arts program in other schools. Uh, the only culinary arts kitchen that we currently have is at, at Lumberton High School. The other have foods programs, but they cannot, by uh, state requirements, cannot be full culinary programs. And with this state-of-the-art facility that we're embarking on, we will have a full culinary arts program. We're really, really excited about that. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Irvin, help us out, please. Uh, Mr. Terry Locke will send us some information on game design. Where would that fit? Would that be on? It, it would fit in that network engineering and computer okay. engineering. We actually, um, we applied to go to that, but of course, you know, I think Charlotte Mecklenburg picked, uh, filled that up right quick. But we are looking at other options, and there are some other training throughout the state that we will be sending our folks to to look at that. And um, we, we've also got some some equipment that we're looking at that we can start that now before we even get to the, to the new location. And that that is a big component with those network students and those computer engineering students, and. At, and I'm not a gamer, so I don't know all the ins and outs of all that stuff, but it's amazing the information and the knowledge that skill-based that those students gain from simply gaming. So it's, it's, it's very big. Any, any other questions about, about those courses that we just talked about? Mr. Herman, you, we went down to your fair that day when children were demonstrating. Mm -hmm. Now tell me what course this was. And those children were estimating how long it would take a chicken to go to market. In other words, the feed and everything. Mm -hmm. And then also they were telling me they could do a pig that, like get the pig and it was born and it's going to take so much feed and it'd be ready to go to market. So they were doing it on the computer. So where would that fit in? In well, which course they were doing that. And I thought it was so amazing because these people with the chicken farms and yeah. all and the hog farms yeah. that actually they can do it on computer to estimate how long it's going to take. And Yes. So, so that can interact with a lot of the different programs that we have and especially it uh, goes along with our agri-science programs and ag production programs because they get heavily into watching that that chick grow up and follow it through the whole process and, and you know and they can calculate the amount of feed per day yeah. and all that good stuff yeah it's, and, and, and you know right now a lot of folks are in the market for chickens because the egg prices are so high so if you need some information, contact your local ag instructors and they'll be able to help you with that process because some of our campuses have chicken houses or chicken coops on campus and they are raising chickens and collecting eggs and that kind of stuff already. 
okay? So uh, also, in addition to the programs that we currently had and the two new programs that we are carrying there, we're looking at the mechatronics, and this is heavily in the industry world where they'll be dealing a lot with the pneumatic systems, the hydraulic systems, the electronic systems, and other components that it takes to operate a, a full industry operation. So that is another, there's only six currently in the state right now. And because those six are offered as local course options, the state is gonna be looking at making that a state program. So I, I figure by the time we are relocated to the new site, it'll be a state standard course. Then we also have three different areas, three different areas that industry labs, are. the industry labs are where different industries can come in and do training that they need people to know how to do when they come to work. For example, I had a long conversation with Spectrum. Spectrum is the uh, one who is doing a lot of the internet services throughout the county. And they need, right now, they have a big shortage of fiber optic technicians. But the, the, the big problem, big barrier that we've had is to get a student to do that internship, they need to be 18 in, in those <clears throat> industries. So if we have industry space available, then that industry comes in on our campus and do the training as an internship on our campus, and we don't have to worry about that insurance barrier. So those students that are 17 and 18, can, or 16, 17 even, can go ahead and get that training under their belts so that they can go out into the real world and go to work after graduation day with Spectrum or whoever, uh, Duke Energy. We've had conversation with Duke Energy with, in the same aspect. They would like to come and set up programs to train students to be able to go to work with them immediately after high school. Any questions? Any comments, Ms. Oceans? Hold on, the technician's getting you ready. Oh yeah? Mr. Chair, I mean, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Herman, um, a lot of businesses that uh, contacted us before, like you mentioned, was about um, wanting to get involved and um, support the program. In phase one, would that take place or what phase would that take place? And also a redundant question would be, um, I've had quite a few calls about um, questions that came from me that I felt like should have been answered internally from CTE staff. Um, do you do you all have regular meetings to make all staff aware of what's going on with the program and also the new facility that's going to take yes. place? Yes, we do. We have monthly meetings um, on all of our campuses. We have monthly meetings and also with the, the Folks at the Career Center, we have monthly meetings there every second Tuesday, I believe it is. Oh, there we go. In my mind, um, these uh, programs, when you think about the difference between CTE programs and non-CTE programs, uh, CTE program should have an, an, an immediate impact on our economy. Maybe not all of them, but there's the CTE, that means training. And when I think about training, that means training for a, a job. So what process do we have in place for uh, maybe evaluating our current programs and what data do we have to support, um, what data do we use to support um, the idea of these new programs and how they're going to actually be successful. What sort of data sources did we use for that? We're looking at the uh, job outlook for our area, and there, there are several different organizations that actually pull data and send that out to you. And then, as, as I mentioned before, my future NC 
they, they printed out just for Robinson County. And the biggest thing, as I've said before, the biggest thing for Robinson County is construction. The, the North Carolina just released the top three counties that are the fastest growing in North Carolina. It's Hoke, Moore, and, oh gosh, what's the one right up above that? And I had it in my mind, I just lost it. Anyway, it's those that are surrounding Cumberland County. Well, if it's in those three counties and we are on the backside of Cumberland County, guess what's gonna happen when the, um, the 295 or is loop around federal is complete. And we are seeing some of that in the northern part of our county already. Construction is a big, big industry and it's growing constantly every day. There, there it is. She turned me off. Okay, my question, Dr. Herman, is, is really fast. As far as drone technology, we've never, we've never done drones before, have we? Right, we haven't. Okay, so as far as the drones being on one of our campuses, does that play a part in the policy we have against unmanned devices? Like, would that policy have to be updated? Yes, there will be. Uh, we will have to look at insurance policies for that. But because it is a, a training uh, facility and it's not, you know, it's not people just out on their own, we'll be able to get the um, unmanned aircraft uh, certification. Okay. So the state has already put stuff in place because there are some schools in the state that have full uh, drone programs. Okay. Okay. And that, that was my question, like, not as far as like accidental insurance or, or, insurance where we would be liable. I mean, like we have a policy about unmanned devices. Like, un, un, so would that policy be modified? Right, for okay. real. And, and we will be having a limited fly space too. And, you know, if, at the site, we, we have quite a bit of acreage there. So we are, we'll have a nice flight space where students will be able to learn how to maneuver that, those uh, unmanned devices. If, if I may, to uh, Ms. Lockley's point, and, and Bobby, this is really to you. So the design of, of the building is such that it's gonna be flexible. So we're not locking ourselves in long-term to any program. And so as we get students certified and credentialed, we can flip one program out mm -hmm. and another program been intentional about that design. And that your point is well taken. We don't want to lock ourselves in. And then, um, Herman, to you, in terms of the industrial labs in phase two, uh -huh. we are working with the county and economic development in terms of that, because that list, Mr. Brewer, that you mentioned, that's who we want to pull from, again, as we create those labs. But we are working with the county and economic development, right. correct? Exactly. We are. And the, the other thing, as you mentioned, the not just our programs are flexible, but the industrial labs are very flexible. They're, they're going to be where, you, you know, if you don't need as much space and we can pull, uh, you know, mobile doors through there and have one industry on one side and one on the other. It's very flexible. And I, I think I think the design team has done a wonderful job at the design level to make sure it will not meet the needs just for 25, but even for 2050 and above. Finally, the, the question in the last board meeting was, um, are teachers having input? And yes. so we did yes. schedule the meeting uh, in terms of equipment and if you speak to that. Yes, we, we had, uh, Help me keep my day straight, Bobby. Last Tuesday? Uh, 
about last Tuesday. Anyway, in, in our December meeting, when we talked about we're at the point of bringing in maybe a equipment company, our request was that they meet at the career center, the current career center, so that the design team and the equipment company both could have a feel of what our programs currently look like and the space that they were currently working in, plus have a dialogue with each individual instructor as to how their programs and how they foresee that program operating in the future. So we did do that. It took almost all day to do that, but, but it was well worth it. I've gotten great positive feedback from those teachers and we got excellent feedback from the equipment company, the design team, and some other folks that were on the engineering component of, of the building itself. So it was very beneficial for, for that. I thought I saw Mr. Craig's hand. Last week, but that that group was uh, I did meet with them here, right. and uh, they were very impressive. All those uh, the folks that were providing input with what we could do with that building. Uh, my question, Mr. Herman, and I didn't make it this year, but when you were at the farmers market, what grade is brought down there to see the different programs? Is it just eighth grade? Okay, so we have two different events. Mm -hmm. we, we have a career uh, expo, mm -hmm. which is 11th and 12th grade students to come and actually meet with industry partners who would come in and set up booths and, and they share their job outlooks and what they need to be able to go to work for them. That, that's one event. Now, the, the Career Center Expo was all eighth graders in the county. Okay. That's a two day event where all eighth graders were brought through to do hands-on activities of every program that we currently offer. That's the one I'm wanting to address, okay. We've said August the 25, and, and that's a tremendous job, if folks. If you've never been down there to see what's going on, it's worth going to see. My comment is whatever we can do between now and when the school is built. You know, a lot of kids, all they see what goes on at Career Center is on paper. Mm -hmm. They don't get to see what's actually being done. So as much as that, I'm not going to say we can do it more than once or twice a year. I know it's probably not feasible to bring all that to each high school or each elementary or middle school, excuse me. But whatever we can do in two years to make sure our kids know what's going on down there and what will be going on during your department, superintendent, whatever can be done to let people know. Because we said for many years that the Career Center was the best hidden secret we had in this county as far as the kids and what they're doing down there. And we just need to make sure whatever we can do to help to get that word out so kids know that's an option instead of staying at the high school all day. Nothing wrong with that. But for some kids, the Career Center or Technology School is going to be the best place for them to be. And we need to make sure that they understand that. And I guess I'm going back a few years ago. They didn't really find it out until they were a senior. And then there was things there they couldn't do or couldn't get involved in. So whatever we can do on that, I'm sure y'all will. So let's make sure we keep working on that. And just to add to that, last year was our first year of doing that showcase mm -hmm. where we brought in 1,800 eighth graders in that two day period. And we did, this year we have seen a significant increase of enrollment mm -hmm. because those kids now have a connection of what those programs really are. Prior to that, they, they did tours at the Career Center, but a tour at the Career Center consisted of walking through a classroom, hearing a five minute presentation, mm -hmm. but not touching anything. Mm -hmm. the, the, exp, uh, the Career Center showcase is where students are actually engaged in that. Yeah, thank you. We probably need to move on. Any more burning questions? Okay, Mr. Turk. I, I took a look at DPI's website as it relates to um, CTE programs earlier, and I noticed, I don't, I'm not sure if this information is up to date, but I noticed that they have two grants. One is the um, Career and Technical Education uh, Grade Expansion Grant, and the other one is the Education and Workforce Innovation uh, Program, or EWIF. The only thing about that I saw interesting about the second one is that 
It actually requires a partnership with either a uh, public or private university or community college or some business. So as we are um, thinking about uh, the expansion of programs, maybe these two and some additional ones, um, that, that could, I think we should really um, do some evaluation to see if it's a possibility that we could create some partnership, you know, to help fund these initiatives because um, I'm not exactly sure if we're going to get much new funding, um, you know, from the state for, for, you know, expanding programs. So that's something that we may, may need to start thinking about now. And if we can establish those from the outset, um, I think we would be in, in better shape down the road. Yeah, well, we currently have a partnership with um, Robinson Community College in several different ways. So, um, and and I don't know if you know that Robinson Community College also received a, a needs grant and they'll be building uh, a new facility on their campus too. And we're constantly in conversation with someone at RCC as to what programs they're gonna be put in there because our programs should be just, you know, a constant seamless flow to the next level. And they're, they've called me to talk about the, our, what we're gonna be having in our school so that they can look at the next level so students won't have to go to Richmond or to Federal Tech or to Southeast and to continue that level of education. Uh, I don't have the exact data of that. My question was, do we have any, do we have any data um, uh, on the number of students that transfer from our CTE programs to local community colleges? To other community colleges or just from our system? program, from our CTE programs that matriculate to other community colleges, like you mentioned before, the ones that we have those relationships with. Yeah. I don't have that, that data uh, up to date with it. The graduation exit survey might give you some of that. I mean, I'm not quite sure know exactly what you're asking, but the, the kids do a graduation survey. Am I going in the army or am I going blah, 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 blah. So that might give you some information. Okay, no more questions. We thank you, Mr. Herman, great thank job. You. And I do want to uh, validate with the superintendent. We have approved this phase one before, sometime back when we were in the planning stage. Um, great job, Mr. Herman. Um, Lap RAS update, Mr. Bobby. Good evening, uh, Chairman Dr. Emanuel, uh, Superintendent Williamson, board members. Just to give you a quick update as we finished out our first semester uh, with our combined program of LAP and RAS. So we can see here that LAP finished first semester with uh, 47 of our students earning four or more credits. Uh, those could be earned in combination of new and or credit recovery classes to get them ready for graduation. We uh, had 26 of our students that earned at least three or less credits. Um, first semester for RAS, we kind of expected this. We only were able to, we served 12 students there this first semester. Um, so again, we did anticipate an uptick in second semester and that has already occurred. So um, we currently have 24 students assigned to RAS that had gotten there either late November, early December, or we're placed there once we come back over Christmas break. And you can see the majority of those students are at the middle school level with 14 students uh, out of the 24 being from middle school. Currently, we do not have any sixth graders there, although the program is designed for 612. At the current moment, we do not have any sixth graders attending RAS. Uh, when we have possibly three pending hearings scheduled in the next week or so. So of course that number is gonna go up. So uh, I did not include, I just got the current numbers for second semester for LAP. We are looking at today as a minimum of, ha or at least having 35 students there. Mr. Blue and his staff is in constant communication back and forth with the high schools to uh, see if there are additional students who would need LAP. But they are uh, keeping it in mind that RAS numbers are going to go up as the semester goes along. Any questions? All uh, right. Ms. Brew. 
Uh, Mr. Bobby, um, I was um, uh, I was questioned by two of our uh, lab volunteers or, or part-time workers, and their concern is that our middle school student population is to a point. It was the, the question is: Should we have two two sessions, two classes instead of at one? Uh, the question to me was: How many students is is uh, required? to be a break off per class. And this being a lap program, did we feel that uh, we should be focusing on smaller numbers in a class versus 26 students? And right, also, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So once the students are assigned there, that daily schedule becomes the responsibility of Mr. Blue and his staff and how he schedules and places those students in individual classes. Okay, and I understand that the teachers are rotating two on one week uh, or day and two on another day. Uh, also, it was brought to my attention that the RASP, can you help me understand the difference between LAP and RASP? Um, because the concern was RASP students was being included into the LAP program. They were being taught the same thing. And some of those students are, are liking it so much, they're saying, hey, we're gonna go back to our school and create a problem and come back to this because we like it. Right. So there, there is no difference in the curriculum or courses that LAP students take versus RAS. All of the students are enrolled because we uh, incorporated APEX as the curriculum program there. So regardless of either one of the programs, the kids are still receiving their core instruction from what they would receive from their home school. So again, you know, there's no difference between the coursework in either of the two programs. How do they distinguish between middle school and high school? The Apex has middle school courses on it as well. So uh, the kids are scared when they go down there, they're able to complete the coursework online and the tutors, teachers would then uh, assist them in anything that they would need additional support in. So it's actually individual needs. Yes. Okay. And they work through the modules individually. Okay. Um, Mr. Bobby, would you mind just since Mr. Henry brought it up, talk about the student teacher ratio. There is none at one of these alternative schools. Teacher may have, for one instance, she may have four kids or five kids. It's, you know, you're there for the needs of the child, not necessarily. There's no quoted quote quotient that the teacher has to have in those situations. Now, has that changed, Mr. Bobby? No, that has not changed. That's still the case. All right, I'm, I have a question. Have you work or someone work or is there an understanding about flexible scheduling with the administration and the teachers there? I guess what I'm asking, do they know our concept of flex scheduling, how this week there may be a schedule, next week there may be another schedule to fit the needs of the children? Are you comfortable that they understand how to do that and implement that? Yes, currently uh, they did roll over the lap schedule, which were four periods in the in the day. But now with the increase of RAS and the increase of middle school students, then that flex schedule is going to have to take place for them. I guess my question is, can they schedule in a way that the sixth grader, seventh grader is not in there with high school seniors? Yeah, absolutely. They could put all of the middle schools in one in one classroom if that's the way they develop their schedule for that. And day. they understand that that's what should be required. I guess I'm not trying to be tough. I'm trying to get to the bottom line that sixth grade kids should not be in there with high school students. Right. We can communicate that to the staff there. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Ms. Oceans. Okay, so Mr. Bobby, can you give me a break? How many teachers are currently, how many teachers are currently on campus for RAS? Uh, it varies day by day because they are part-time uh, from the skit, the last schedule Mr. Blue shared with me uh, on a daily basis, there's a minimum of four. So that's where that kind of four period day comes in. On other days, there may be as many as six or seven. Okay, so my question is this, I have, there's a, a concern for me to have that many kids on that campus with behavior problems with that group of, of, of staff. Um, 
we're saying we're adding to RAS as if that's something that we want to be doing. Um, and I, I don't I don't agree. Um, RAS should be a very, very, very last alternative. Um, once you put a bunch, a lot of people in, in a place with a bunch of different behaviors and you don't have the right staff to maintain or control, we're going to run into a problem. Um, so the, te the, the numbers going up without the appropriate staff, I think is going to create an issue. So, so currently, again, in terms of teachers, I think Mr. Blue operates between six and eight. He has a full-time social worker that's there every day, a full-time counselor that's there as well. Uh, we also have a full-time resource, resource officer that spends his morning directing traffic at Southside and then spends the remainder of the day at, um, at la a lab slash RAS. Mm -hmm. so, so again, the, the number right now, again, is gonna be approximately 60 students should be on campus uh, at this point in the school year. Any more comments, questions, Mr. Turner? I've got two and I'm gonna, I, I promise I'm gonna try to be quick, be brief. Um, it's my understanding that I don't, I'm not sure about now, but I know in the past we've had students, um, you know, in high school um, that have been accused or, you know, maybe out on bond for, for violent crimes, you know, house arrest, that sort of thing. Um, do we have a, a process uh, countywide to make sure that well, first of all, I, I, I mean, I've got a, a ninth grader and I don't want my child, you know, walk in the halls with somebody who's been, you know, who's on house arrest for a violent crime. But is that left up to the schools or is that, um, or do we have a countywide process on how those individuals get handled? Is it just their decision not to, you know, to remain at their school? How does that work? Uh, we do have a policy that addresses uh, students who are convicted felons and students who have pending felonies. So depending upon the charge that the student comes in with, we have worked with principals and some of those students, we have placed them where they're completing their assignments online. Other students who have criminal charges, uh, depending again, depending upon the severity, uh, may have been assigned to RAS. Um. Mr. Bobby, but if a child is underage, we have to uh, provide some kind of educational program for them, some kind of alternative setting. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Did they? Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't I'm hear saying, you. can we make it automatic that they go to, you know, the alternative I'm program? I'm not sure about all that. I make it automatic. I'm, I'm not sure. If, I mean, I, I don't know. Can I, just to clarify that, in any instance where a principal becomes aware that convicted felony or charged with a felony, they contact me and we discuss that. And again, uh, I would say at this point in the school year, 100% of those students have ended up at, in an alternative city. Okay. I got one more quick question, Dr. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Emanuel, I promise. Um, let me see. I got some. Okay, so when, when we discussed the implementation of the of, of the APEX program, um, it was it was made clear that like uh, essentially all of our courses are are in there, and and my I, and I was was thinking that um, we could maybe uh, leverage this platform for students uh, that that are um, that are that are maybe uh, qualified or. Um, uh, should be in higher courses like calculus two or whatever and those courses may or may not be offered you know at their school are we utilizing it to um ensure that, that students that are you know above average or you know they're not leaving school early you know early dismissal and all of that we want to make sure that that students aren't sitting in school bored to death um and don't have i've heard the, the statement before um, that a, a high schooler had ran out of math. They had essentially, you know, they didn't have nothing else to take. And this was at a place where they didn't have like calculus two and all these advanced courses. Are we leveraging this system for those situations? Yeah, so uh, Apex is not just utilized at LAP and RAS. Uh, there are situations where kids are taking additional courses outside of the regular school day. 
And, and Mr. Terry, some children, the aim is to graduate early. I mean, I, I won't tell names, but some children graduate high school in three years as far as the number of courses they're taking now. I'm, I'm talking about walking across the stage. It's just, just it's, it's a different society now. It's not just four years for everybody. Some kids just take those courses and get go for it. They're finished. All right. Any more questions? We probably need to move on. If I may. So yes. the reason we uh, selected APEX was so that we could match up a student schedule. Uh, the difficulty prior to that was that we couldn't. And so kids would sit there, finish the work, whatever they had to do. But with APEX, we offer AP honors, all of that, those courses. But we can always match up, including CTE courses, a student schedule. And that was important. Can't hear you, Mr. Terry. Any idea uh, on the number of students that are in that situation and participating in this Early program? Graduation. Uh, I, I have no clue. I don't know. And just to add to Dr. Emanuel, to, to, when we look at these 36 kids that are up here, RAS is the alternative because it, last year at this point, these 36 kids probably would have been long-term yeah. because of that behavior that led them to the principal making the decision or recommendation for them to go to, to go to RAS. And one comment that I would like to make, and you all can tell me if things have changed. The state says we have to have an alternative setting slash alternative school. We don't have an option. I mean, setting slash or school. Yeah. So you got to give kids a second chance that can't cut it in the regular school. Any more comments? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Locklear. All right, next thing, kindergarten registration. Good evening, Chairman Dr. Emanuel, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, board members. At this time, I'll yield to Jan Newman, which is our district nurse supervisor, who does spearhead the kindergarten registration. Good afternoon, Dr. Emanuel and Dr. Williamson, board members, cabinet members. Um, in August, at our Leadership Academy, um, we sent out some information to the principals um, about kindergarten registration with the March 30th, 31st date. The principals let us know that it was um, a better option for them if they were able to pick their dates for the kindergarten registration. So for parent convenience, we asked them to do a morning registration time, an evening registration time, as well as a third date for makeup date um, for registration times to accommodate maybe our folks that work night shift or day shift to accommodate everybody around. So um, this gives them three opportunities to register their child. So by Friday the third, this Friday, I'm just gonna go back over that calendar. I do have a calendar listed at the bottom um, that has all the dates listed on there for each school. Um, so I'm gonna verify this Friday to make sure and just verified that there's no changes or no conflicts and then that will be pushed out i'm going to get with um, each school nurse i'm going to ask and each excuse me each school to do their own advertising whether it be flyers um, social media um, newsletters and then i'm going to get with miss jessica to push that out via text messages or social media and then our robocalls um, we did have a parent engagement night on January 19th over at the farmer's market, and we had an Ask a Professional panel there. We had a, a good turnout that night, and our main focus that night was vaccines and immunizations and the importance of, so we had a panel of school nurses, we had a pediatrician, and we also had the epidemiologist from um, the Robinson Health Department there to answer any questions that parents may have about the importance of vaccines and immunizations and why they needed those. So we had a great turnout there. Um, 
do I need to go over? There's a packet there. We updated this sheet to reflect um, everything that should be added into the enrollment packet to make sure that every parent got the necessary forms that they needed for, for the engagement or for the enrollment dates. My, my only recommendation is somehow that we bold black and white make sure they know the age cutoff date because that's always one thing that there may be a comment that I know my kid's smart and it missed it by one day and I want him in. But I think parents need to know up front, that's not us making that up, that's state law. Yes, ma'am. Is that that cutoff date is one thing that causes angst sometimes to parents and schools. Because, you know, you want to accommodate parents, but if they miss it by one day, two day, we can't help that that's law, state law. Yes, but that makes sure, I, I would say, make sure that's advertised widely. And I'm not sure about the shots, it, how it's changed, but maybe the mandated shots too, that that's just advertised wise, wisely. Yes, yes ma'am. I have a list of those and I'll make sure when Jessica pushes that out on our calls and, and on social media and through the com internet that we have those listed on there as well. Appreciate it. You're and, very welcome. Any other questions? Mr. Brewer. Ms. Newman, I'm looking at uh, in the stapled packages, one sheet, and then we had, I guess this is an updated form? Yes, sir, that's the updated. So this, this supersedes the ones that stay? Yes, sir. Okay. So if I, could, if I could add to that, Mr. Brewer, when we originally sent out the information and disseminated that information in August, we set our target deadline for completion of those dates today. So when you actually received that information yesterday, Patty received that, we still had a few schools that we needed to touch base with today. So the final sheet that you have, the second sheet without the missing information is the final sheet that Jan has talked about. And we will verify with schools that those are the dates before we make that final submission and we launch the advertisement and the campaign for the district. Any more comments? Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Great welcome. job. And also, there are provisions if a child moves into the district, they can register at any time if they meet all the requirements. Right, ladies? All right. Next, we have the STEM band update. Um, good evening, Dr. Emanuel, Dr. Williamson, board members. I'm here to give you an update on the STEM STEAM band. The van is here. It's in the process of being wrapped. It's the process of getting the shelves installed and supplies are starting to come in. So what we're looking at is within the next couple of weeks to be have the van on the road traveling to our elementary schools, offering STEM lessons for our students. These lessons will be aligned to the standards for science, math, ELA and social studies. It's gonna be utilizing that engineering design process. And as our science standards are changing in the next couple of years, that process is gonna be really important, not only for our students, but for our teachers to see. So by ex exposing them to that now, they are gonna be well prepared in the next couple of years. I've also talked with Herman about partnering with different industries and creating these STEM lessons aligned to what our industry partners need so that we can start building that pipeline towards that new career and technical center. Because if we capture those students in elementary school, then they can define that pathway in middle school and they are ready to go to that career center in high school. Are there any uh, questions? I, I have a question. Who who drives and I mean, does it go around like the bookmobile used to? Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna be behind the wheel and yes, it's gonna go like the bookmobile. Um, principals are gonna sign up and it's gonna rotate through the district. And what the teachers will do is we're gonna focus really on that fifth grade for this year, simply because that fifth grade is a tested year for science. So we're really wanting to build that fifth grade. And then we um, hope to tie it to all the curriculums, but fifth grade is that first tested year. So that's the year we're gonna focus on first. That's neat, thank, thank you. <laughs> any, any comments, questions? Uh, Mr. Boyd and Mr. Terry. Ms. Hendricks, um, I'm, I'm here in fifth grade. Uh, what, uh, what target of students are we reaching here? Is that all levels? Is that from kindergarten to 12 or Eventually, high school included? Eventually, we want the STEM to include K-12. 
Um, but this year, with focusing with a limited amount of time, we're wanting to hit that first Texas subject. So that'd be fifth grade science. Uh, we will be partnering with different schools for their STEM nights and different community events as well. And when we have those programs, it would be K-12. So any would be open and all to that. Okay. So it's listed on my agenda as STEM, and it's, uh, it says STEM up there, but the yeah. van looks like it says STEAM. STEAM. We have, uh, we're also incorporating art because if you, lo if you look now, um, they are saying that art is a part of the STEM component. And in fact, we just received word that we're gonna be partnering with an agency and they're gonna bring, bring in artificial intelligence and digital art into our middle schools. So we are wanting to incorporate and embrace that as well. Thank you. Anyone else? If I may. Yes, sir. Ms. Henderson, again, thank you for your passion, uh, the pictures. Thank you for sending those, the expression on our student face as hands-on learning. And then, um, if I'm understanding correctly from a conversation, STEM will be provided for pre-K students in partnership, correct? Yes, our pre-K students, actually we got a grant with LEGO um, Education. So we have put um, LEGO Discovery in every pre-K classroom this year. We have um, robotics in every elementary school and we have a high school robotics team in every high school this year. So we are, within the next three years, every single school will have robotics. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we're moving on to Battle of the Books. Ms. Humphrey. Good evening, Dr. Emanuel. Good Dr. evening. Dr. Williams and board members. I'm here to give you updates on the Battle of the Books competition. Our first competition will be, all competitions for PSRC will be held at Southeast Agriculture Center this year. Our first one coming up is um, high school. Then we'll go to the middle, elementary, and grace, second and third. Our regional competitions, um, middle school will be held in Bladen County. They will be hosted. And as you see on the dates, there <coughs> is a scheduled conflict with our middle school, regional, and our second and third grades. I have contact in Bladen County. I'm, I'm not sure if they go be able to, you know, adjust their date because I'm sure they've already um, booked Bladen Community College, but I'm trying to work with them and see to make sure we have, you know, representation. Um, our regional elementary fourth and fifth grade will be held in Cumberland County, and then our regional high school will be held in Cumberland County. Robinson County was supposed to host the regional this year, but because of Dr. Baldwin's retirement, um, Hope County and Cumberland County agreed to co-host that competition, and then we'll just be put back in a rotation another year. If if you haven't been to one of these competitions, those children are brave and they take it so seriously. It's and we're really really proud of their accomplishment. Yes, ma'am. Um, I tell you what, the little tykes, the little children get in. That just started the little ones. How many years has that been going on? The small children, the K2, K3. Second it, and third. Um, it, I mean, it's not been probably a couple of years. Yes, it's, it's, it's relatively been very many new. years, probably about six or seven. Yes, that that's relatively new. new. And they're really brave. And the thing about it, they have to read these books yes, to be able to participate. And that's a long list of books, too. Anyway, any comments, questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Humphrey. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, Mr. Brewer. Yes, sir. Ms. Humphrey, will you be sharing this with the board of board members? Yes, yes sir. Yes, that will go into PAC. A lot of this information will go into PAC, Mr. Brewer. It's just information. So it will be in the PAC. All right, now, district-wide accreditation update, Dr. Carr. Good evening, Chairman Dr. Emanuel, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, and board members. Um, so today, I'm going to give a quick update about Cognia district-wide accreditation. We had a team of um, principals, district office staff that helped us complete the district um, accreditation. Part of that included classroom observations, and we focused on fourth grade math um, due to what we saw in test scores. 
We also did stakeholder surveys with parents, guardians, students, teachers, and then we also could, um, completed a student performance analysis. So we looked at all the data that we collect from all the data sources, EOG, check-ins, um, any sort of benchmarks, universal screeners to determine how um, we look as a district. And after we did all of that, we completed a executive summary and narratives for each of the areas. And as of today, uh, about four o'clock, we submitted our Cognia. So we are now waiting on March 1st to complete our presentation to the team um, so that we can process and continue um, with working through the Cognia District accreditation. Any questions about the accreditation process? No, but I think going district-wide is the thing to do. It used to be a very painful process when we had to do so many per year, very painful, but, um, Will you mind telling if the public's listening, what is the purpose of being accredited? And I'm sorry, I couldn't. What is the purpose of going through accreditation? To show that our schools um, meet all the criteria of being a good, solid school so that we have standards in place, that we have partnerships in place, that we follow policies, that we do all those different things that a good, solid school does provide services to our students. So to show that a school in Robertson County is just as good as a school in California, in, in essence, is the way I see it, and you're totally correct. All right. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, by the way, universities have to go through this. Daycares have to go through. They may have their own different organizations that go, that go through or conduct it, but they have to go through accreditation as well. Yes, sir. Is the are, are the uh, surveys anonymous? Yes, they are. Okay, so uh, in particular for the uh, for the teachers, how do, do do we go above and beyond to make sure that that they know that it's anonymous and that they um, feel like they can respond to, the, to these survey questions um, in a candid way. So the survey is actually done through Cognia. It's not through, done through our platform so that it goes directly through Cognia and we get the results. So that way we do not know who it's coming from. So it's trying to prevent that. Mm -hmm. More comments? You want to say something about Oh, Ms. Brewer. I, I guess you touched on it. So would, would it be fair to say for the ones listing that the state is the overseer for this cognito process? Or is this a, a individualized uh, company that does this for us? This is a company that does it for us, but then the, there is a state rep that does help support the school system to help go through these processes. So the state does have a handshake in it? Not in actually the accreditation, but just helping us as far as processing what to do. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. May, may I add? You can um, do anything you would like well, to do. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, so the name change, um, historically, the district was Southern Schools Association. So it, the name has changed over, over the years, but it's still the same process that's always been in place. Thank you, Dr. Carr. I, I would like to take pleasure to move the scholarship next. Do you all mind? Let's just go ahead and get the scholarship out of the way. Let's do scholarship. And this is uh, Megan and Dr. I mean, Jennifer and Ms. Freeman and Megan Collins. Let's do scholarships and get that one out of the way. And then we can all be curriculum then, uh, the cu curriculum. Good evening, Chairman, Good evening. Dr. Emanuel, Dr. Williamson, and board. Thank you for your time. Um, so if you will look to the screen, um, we're going to discuss the scholarship opportunities and deadlines and how we are making that awareness out into communities and making sure they have access. Um, as you can see there, we do have an example listed for one of our schools. So if you go to the school websites, and you can access this from the PSRC website, when you access the actual high schools, you can find that they have a section that lists for scholarships. 
within these links, within these web pages, it lists the different types of scholarships, the deadlines, how to access them, what the GPAs are expected, and how much those scholarships are. Thank you. Um, so we reviewed a st um, student profile, looking at what they have done so far, where they're at, ACT, SAT, um, their CTE cert certifications, FAFSA, making sure they have those things in place and make sure we provide any student assistance necessary to possibly apply for these scholarships and encourage them. And some of the scholarship nominees that we have, um, some of the scholarships that we're aware of at this point in time, there are finalists out there. They have not been selected just yet, but there are finalists. Also, we are aware that there are some more out there that just not have been selected just yet. Would, would you read, because I think that's so important, those scholarship nominees, especially with the more head and those, would you read that too? Yes. So we have two UNC Chapel Hill Moorhead Kane scholarship finalists. Do we know which schools they're from yet? Yes, ma'am. Um, those are from Lumberton Senior High. We have two semi-finalists for North Carolina State University the Goodnight Scholars Scholarship Program. Do we know where they are? Lumberton Senior High. Okay. We have one from the North Carolina State University Park Scholars Scholarship finalists, also Lumberton Senior High. For East Carolina, um, ECU Honors College Acceptances, which is for $10,000 each, Lumberton Senior High. We have some finalists that haven't won yet, but they were they are in competition within the last round to be selected. We are aware that there has been one scholarship that is awarded, and that's at Pernoswit High School for ten thousand dollars. And there have been some others. We just we haven't got the details as to which scholarships those are just yet. Um, excuse me. I'm sure there'll be more, but um, yes. each year doing graduation. At one point, they used to announce the number of scholarships awarded to those schools, different schools, when they did graduation. So I guess our concern is we want to make some children are very aggressive about going to counselors, wanting scholarships, you know, knowing when the dead, deadlines are, and some children are not. So I guess what we want our counselors to do is seek out those children and have those GPAs and get them to come in and say, how you got to feel this out and stay on that. We just want, there are just two kinds of children out there. Those are aggressive and those are not. Say so we have the children, we just have to work with them. Any comments, Trey? Excuse me, Mr. Britt. I was, was going to make it known too that we need to support it as well that um, Maynard's Honors College at UNCP, we do have some already that's been accepted that as well. And I think that's a big accomplishment, especially for local Robinson County as well. I agree with you. Anyone else comments? It was Craig, Mr. Craig and then Mr. Brewer. Uh, Mr. Cole, how many is viewing this right now? Oh, I wish it was 1,600. Uh, reiterating what Dr. Emanuel said, if you go to graduation and like I said, used to, they'd say, well, there's been $800,000 in scholarships awarded this year, or there's been 400,000. My point is, and I agree with her 100%, we gotta go get these kids. The money's out there. And, and come May and June, it's too late to apply for it uh, in many cases. So the money's out there, whatever we can do, when I say I'm talking about a whole school system to get these kids to apply for this money. Uh, there's, there's plenty of money available. Parents, I asked you, if it's counselors, whoever it is, to make these kids a word. There's money out there in many cases if you want to go to school. But uh, if you don't apply, you're not going to get it. That is correct. And that's one of the things that are done at the FAFSA nights. But there's, there was two done in back in October. So when they were applying for FAFSA, um, they received scholarships through that as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Good comment. Mr. Brewer? Mr. Brewer? Um, Ms. Collins, uh, I had a phone call. Um, a parts alumni was volunteering to help whomever was in the parts uh, as a nominee that needed assistance. 
uh, want to reach out and say, I can be of assistance. And um, she asked me who to contact, and I told her to contact that particular principal, and it was, like you said, Lumberton High School. Yes, sir. And um, I don't think there was any reply. So, you know, we have students that's already left Robinson County Schools, that's went through these processes, that are, come, that are reaching back and saying, I want to help other students in Robinson County. So I think we need to incorporate into our program uh, some kind of fellowship uh, partnership where we, just like uh, saw in the email we received where uh, they're documenting where students are going after they leave high school, uh, how many progressed on to be and do what they want to do in life. And these are the areas I feel like that we could uh, improve on in the future. And we could reach out to those students because a lot of them don't come back to Robinson County. They, they move throughout the whole United States, but they are saying, hey, I want to help another student that is, that's a nominee. Because there is like four processes, four, four evaluations, I think, like the parks and the Pogue, that they go through before they're awarded the scholarships. And we'll comment, Ms. Turner. Chapel Hill, NC State, ECU, they're all, all good schools, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that UNCP's uh, tuition, uh, with the tuition promise program, our, our tuition is $500. So you may not need as much in terms of scholarship um, money to, uh, to attend the university. But um, based on what you said, I'm, I'm counting, and it looks like there's, there's 10. And I know Lumberton's, uh, you know, the largest school in the county, but nine out of 10 of the, uh, you know, the students that you mentioned come from Lumberton. They're, they're large, but they're not 90%. So what's Lumberton doing? What's their secret sauce here? What are they doing that other high schools aren't doing? So to answer your question, Mr. Terry, we, we will go back and we revisit with our counselors at each of those sites and we will ensure we did make some calls today to see that difference as well. So my final conclusion is, is that we're reaching out to our counselors to ensure that each counselor is reaching out as they should at each high school. When we reached out to our principals today, there are more listings than what we could get. Um, however, we don't know that those students have all been finalized, and so principals were somewhat reluctant today to give us all of that information, which is rightfully so at this time because they've not been yet a, an official nominee. But um, as we move forward, let me assure you what we how do, because I've heard your concerns. I heard them again last year. I'm hearing them again this year. Um, what we were going to do is, Megan and I spoke today, we'll be reaching out to each, we're going to make sure we have a point of contact at each site, and we'll begin that outreach process again tomorrow to ensure that we have more students that are currently actually applying and being accepted. Uh, there is a lot of money, as Mr. Craig has said, in the district, and we want our children to pursue that money, and we want our children to be strong-willed and to receive those scholarships. But that is what I believe at this point is making some of the differences. Also, from what we understand today from Lumberton Senior High when we spoke to them, because that question was one of mine as well, is that some of some students, as Dr. Emanuel said, are more aggressive and assertive than others. And so some of those nominees that we heard today, their names, we found that those are more assertive students. But that neither negates that one way or the other because whether you're an assertive student or not, the funding is there, so we need to do a better outreach at the district level. And so I sure we'll, we'll move forward with that as well. Any more comments? Questions? Okay, now, if not, we'll move on. Thank you so much. We'll move on, we'll go to the new curriculum update, Dr. Wendy Dorsey Carr. Good evening again, Dr. Manuel, Dr. Williamson, board members. Um, so I have a few quick updates before I really turn it over to our um, school um, perspective. And so one thing is what you'll see, there's a House Bill 8 currently out there that is talking about every single high school student having to take a computer, high, uh, computer science high school credit. 
So that is currently in one of the bills, um, but we are already being proactive in looking at sixth grade to start with computer science soon. Um, and we also have some high schools that already have computer science courses in place. And so once we find out where this goes, we'll go ahead and move forward with adding whatever we need to for the computer science for high school. Any questions about computer science? Any questions, comments? So quick updates with L Education Eureka. Um, so I do wanna be clear with both of those programs. L Education is purchased through Open Up. Um, which is the company that we purchased with, and then Eureka is purchased through Great Mind. So sometimes you'll hear teachers mentioning one or the other, and it's the same product. Um, with both of those curriculums right now, we have academic coaches coming in on a monthly basis. They receive professional development on both of those and how to utilize those pieces and then go back to the school and unpack those pieces with the teachers so that they can provide individualized support to each of our teachers as they're implementing this new curriculum. Um, but what we also do is as we hear anything about resources, concerns, or anything, we consistently review the resources that are brought to our attention and we'll continue that process as we work through the curriculum um, and make adjustments based on feedback in any gaps that we see as we move forward as we would with any other curriculum that we put in place in the district. Um, the other thing that we have going on is classroom observation. So Eureka does a great job and L Education does a great job um, as far as or open up. They come and actually observe classrooms with us to say where should we be with implementation right now. And so with both of those um, consultants that we've had come, they've given us really positive um, feedback about what it looks like in our classrooms and on our schools just because where we are in implementation that they're really in the right place. They're starting to really grapple more with it. The um, teachers have a greater understanding and they'll be able to speak to that at the beginning of the year. Teachers may have struggled a little with certain things, but as they get more comfortable and understand the curriculum more and academic coaches are able to take professional development back, there's greater understanding of what that should look like in the classroom and how they can make it their own in their classrooms. Um, and then also we conduct classroom observations just so that we can help support them as we go through, of course. I know um, sometimes we hear that the standards or the teaching of the standard is very fast paced in this curriculum. Um, but what we also found is previously a lot of times the standards weren't completely covered. So what we might have is 30 or 40 percent of the standards that you see on an EOG actually being covered because they're piecemealing things from different places because they're trying to work really hard in pulling resources. What this has allowed them to do is just have that one resource where we know all the standards are covered. And so we do know that students have different needs, have different paces that they need to learn. And so what we have built in is small group time. So the first hour, if you're in elementary school, is purely whole group sort of instruction with break off constantly in small groups and pairs. But then the second hour truly is focused on that small group instruction where everybody can differentiate. And I'll let them speak more to those pieces. But that's the opportunity to reteach, help a student, um, and even fill in gaps. The other part we have um, scheduled every day is intervention time every day in every school, K-8. So that was one of our non-negotiables when we looked at the master schedule because we knew we always have students that may have additional needs or just are struggling with a certain standard. How do we build that time in? And so part of that was to have that additional time in the day to help support all of our students. And then also in our pacing guide, what you'll see and teachers see is something called flex days. So flex days are built throughout the calendar so that if we need to spend an extra day or some additional time on something, that gives them a little more time to review or readdress certain pieces. With both curriculums, though, what you'll see is it constantly re- um, the curriculum constantly brings up those standards over and over again so that they're constantly touched on throughout the uh, year instead of just a one point in time because we know students don't grasp a standard just one time they need to see it over and over so it cycles in and out throughout the curriculum to help support them so is there any questions before i let our three or four people speak i have two principals coming to speak i also have a teacher and an academic coach that I've invited to come and speak about what they've seen, how it's going in their schools, and what they're doing to address these pieces that I just um, spoke about. Okay, Ms. Craighead. 
Uh, you can come in. Okay, uh, let me make sure I understand it. The, the curriculum as such, by the end of the year, all objectives of the state testing and everything would be covered. Yes. Where in the past, we might be covering 40% of it, 50% of it, okay? With that said, and we're going at a faster pace than what normally would be on it. Now, benchmarks, were they this week or? Check-ins check are this week. Okay, we used mm -hmm. to call them benchmarks. Mm -hmm. Okay, check-ins now. So we got check-ins this week. Now, are the check-ins aligned with what we're doing as much as they might have used to have been? That's the first part. So as far as the standards, yes, they are aligned. They're same because we teach the same standards that you'll see on a check-in. As mm -hmm. far as the pacing, it may be different. Okay, the pacing is what is different. Mm -hmm. So where it might not be aligned, let's say the test we're doing right now, it's still going along with the standards, but by the end of the year, all of it's supposed to be on the same page. Yes. Okay, thank you. May, may I? Uh, Mr. Superintendent. So to that point, the check-ins this year are new. Yes. And, and so by the end of the year, we will have all that aligned, correct? Yes. And then would you clarify, <clears throat> there was a lot of conversation about um, education, the company, which we don't purchase from, they do not sell. Clarify all of that as a national, international company so that uh, we want the public to understand that a lot of the things that's being circulated um, were not true. And so clarify for us who we purchased from and L Education as a national, international company that really don't sell the products. So ed L Education is a national um, company that produces a lot of different things. But when we go actually purchase, they do not sell any programs themselves. So that's part of what they don't do. So actually Imagine Learning, which a lot of you've heard of, and Open Up sell curriculums. And so that's, we actually chose Open Up to purchase L Education through. And so that's where we went. So what you'll see is L Education puts out a lot of different things because they're a national company, deal with a lot of different things, whereas Imagine Learning and Open Up just deal with selling curriculum. And so that's where we actually deal with Open Up to purchase our curriculum and deal with all of our professional development um, planning sessions. Anyone else like comment? Mr. Okay. Mr. Donnerman. Uh, I got a question I just need to answer. The relay teams that are going into this, is this something that we do as a district or is this part of the curriculum? Where does all that align in this is what my question is. It is something that we're doing as part of leverage leadership and focus on the principal as the instructional leader. So we're in partnership with Relay Graduate School of Education. And again, I know I've heard some concerns about uh, a number of people in the classroom, but we're working with principals and training principals, assistant principals in the future and academic coaches with that. But that is part of our uh, building capacity and principals. We want to address that a little bit more, but that is the relay and leverage the leadership, yes. And I'm also going to state that's also a partnership with our state. So we're the pilot for the state implementing leverage leadership and relay. And so we are one of the pilot districts. Well, we were the only pilot district that did it. And now this year you have another district that's doing it in another 500 schools that are part of that. So this is rolled out from the state and we take that and use that to help build instructional leadership in all of our buildings with every, a lot of the team members that you'll have speak today are going through that because it's a whole school, whole district process. And we would add to that, that uh, Relay Levis leadership is part of the state strategic plan. And so it is the turnaround improvement model that the state would use for the next five years. And so we know that we're on the right track, just ahead of schedule. That's important that state superintendent included that in the strategic plan. Um, he was next. Dr. Carr, just, just a couple of questions. I've been getting some emails, texts, um, things of that sort from teachers mm -hmm. that they have everything that they need to work with. 
I'm just giving you an example. It's saying that they need 10 measuring cups. They need, um, in math, they need a, a bean counter. I just call it a bean counter. It's one of those things you slide and stuff. Who's producing that? Because teachers are having to take their money and go out and buy this stuff. So at the beginning of the year, we actually worked with um, Ms. Freeman and federal programs because we went and took the entire list and went and purchased items for that to supplement. So all those things that you're talking about, most of those items were on that list. And we actually went and sorted, I want to say that was October, maybe November, early November, all those materials came in and we sorted it and provided it at each school. Every classroom also with the materials, it came a math kit that has almost every single resource in it. So it might be that something's missing, but we also said that if you have any local or district, I'm sorry, school or state funds, if there was something additional that you could purchase that to help support it. But we really did as a district pretty much purchase every material you could think of that was part of that curriculum to support them in the implementation. Okay. So it should be at the school. It should be at the school. Okay. And if not, they can let us know so that we can help work with them. Mr. Brewer. Dr. Carr, uh, you mentioned L education. Mm -hmm. um, does L education help LEAs uh, find curriculum materials that that will assist them in whatever their needs are for the county or for that LEA? L education doesn't do any searching. We have to, as a district, find resources that we feel are appropriate for the district. They're not part of the selection process in any way. Um, may, may I do a, I want to hold on just a minute. Mr. Brewer, do you have a follow-up question? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand L education. I heard that lingo and what, what their purpose are in, in relation to helping PSRC with, with the process. L education is not helping us with the program. We purchased the program and then had professional development purchased to help support the implementation. But L education does not choose the curriculum or any of those types of things. When we first did the selection, we looked at all the variety of curriculums and chose that curriculum. And then we outsourced with Open Up additional people to help support us with the implementation of the curriculum, just like you would with any other curriculum that you purchase. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any comments? Did you go? You got? Go. Okay. Dr. Carr, um, just a quick question. We were talking earlier mm -hmm. um, in discussing state standards and things of that sort, mm -hmm. and that books that some people may have questions with or that we had questions about as far as board members mm -hmm. because we didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we contacted the curriculum committee. Um, the thing is, is the state saying that the curriculum that we are teaching matches, set, it was it 70% of what we need to be teaching so, no. So what we do is look at the alignment of the standards to the curriculum and make sure that it at least matches 80 or 90 percent when you look at the curriculum. If that's okay. what you're asking, yes. Because okay. we have to make sure that we purchase something that um, aligns with the standards to ensure that we're really meeting the needs of our students and the standards. But also some, and I'm just saying, some of the books out there are being taught to seventh graders statewide. This is something that Am I, I wrong about saying that, that I mean, it's? Well, the standards are st taught statewide, statewide. So everybody has to have the same standards because those right. are the North Carolina standards. The resources you use vary from county to county based on the particular needs of that county. Great. Madam Chair, may I? Yes, sir. So, so, means so, so let's clarify in terms of our process of the material that's being used and how we vetted those materials and made reference to some books that's being circulated. Um, I think there was three 
there's only one of those books that students have. The other one that's being circulated is a teacher resource book. And the third book that's really is not even part of our inventory. We never purchased that. So, so again, I want to clarify the facts and the truth is that when folks say we're using a particular book, it is not part of our inventory resource. Uh, the way that we vetted that product, we would never have purchased that anyway. Will you speak to that? Sure. So when we originally, of course, looked at curriculums, what we looked at is the data first. So what does the data really show us? So where are our gaps? What's going on? So if you think, for example, with reading, what we saw is a huge gap in K2. Um, phonemic awareness and phonics for years, we've seen there has been tremendous gaps. And so what we had to do is look at that data and determine what is something that also promotes science of reading, because you know that's a big piece with the letters training, and that really supports all of those pieces so that we can ensure that we have strong readers that can also have strong conversations. Because what we know is part of real life is discourse, right? The talking and being able to discuss um, everything in that engagement with what's going on. And so what we did is looked at all the curriculums and how does it match up with the science of reading and what is expected from the state and how does it align up with the data that we have. And so that was for first part of the process because, and that was the same process with math. We had to look at the data, look at our gaps and look at what curriculums help support us help address those gaps. We need more hands-on math, more opportunities for students to really engage so they have a stronger understanding of those concepts in math. I know when I went through school and a lot of us went through school, it was more about let's figure out how to get an answer real quick, but I didn't know why or how. Um, and that can fail you later on in math one and those types of courses. So what we did is looked at those curriculums. And then what we also did is we looked at it as a committee. So not only did I look at it, the curriculum looked at it. We actually had some of the media specialists look through all the books to look and make sure we weren't getting something that we felt would be inappropriate for our students, because that was really important to us to make sure we vetted every book that we had on our list. And so um, part of that afterwards was to really try it out in a few schools, because we wanted to make sure how was teachers interacting with it. We already had some teachers, because there's a free version of some of those products out there using it. And so we actually went and tried and looked and saw the change in our students. Students were more engaged, they were having discussions, the vocabulary was changing. And like I said, these folks that I'm gonna have speak in a few minutes can really tell you a lot more how that shifted and made students interact differently in the classroom. But what we did is did all that before we made a final decision with the committee to say which curriculum would we purchase. We also looked at ed reports, which decides which curriculums are the best across the nation to meet the needs of students. So which ones had the most impact? Both of these curriculums were in the 97, 98%. That's a high percentage when you're looking at a curriculum and the alignment to the needs of students when we think nationally. And we did include parents in that committee that bid it. Correct. Yeah, we had some parents at the other schools that looked at it. Any more comments? Okay, uh, Mr. Boyd. Dr. Carr, you, you mentioned inappropriate material. Mm -hmm. Um, what guidelines, when you when you say inappropriate, what guidelines were you using to uh, deem that by? Was that by state standards requirements? So we look at, of course, state standards. Does it lie with state standards? And then is it just something that may be considered offensive? So you look sense. at uh, Yeah. So we look at banned books, anything that is like that. So we look at all those lists. So media specialists are really good at making sure we have books that meet those needs and those criteria. So we, we, are, we are mandated by the state to meet those criteria is, is what I'm trying to. We have to meet the state standards. Whatever yes. we use has to meet the state standards. Right, yes. and that's what, that's what uh, teachers and parents needs to hear. Okay, thank you. Um, there are, would you make up just a couple comments though? The essential standards in health, mm -hmm. grade seven, they are, would you make a comment on that? Sure. So some of the books, in, and I'll just say in seventh grade were questioned um, that dealt with epidemics and those types of topics. And so what we looked at is what standards also addressed in that. So if you look at seventh grade healthful living, 
those standards are directly addressed in the book. Also, if you look at social studies, they address epidemics in social studies. So not only are we teaching language arts of how to comprehend the text, but when you look at those other content areas, those are topics that we have to address based on the state standards for seventh grade. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine opportunity and more comments. We need, okay, Mrs. Terry, then we need to move on to our school-based persons. They, they want to, this, this is a topic I think is interesting that's been approached a lot about what they're gonna discuss. So Mr. Terry will be our final comment. Mr. Terry. If a parent um, is, a, if a parent objects to a textbook or an assignment, um, do we have a formalized process um, for providing alternatives? Yes, they just, they go through that process. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody else? Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. Now, would you introduce your guest? Sure, so I'm gonna actually go a different order. So I'm gonna ask our teacher, Ms. Ashley, to come from East Robinson and speak first and talk to us about um, the curriculum and the impact in her classroom. Huh? Hello everyone, I'm Ashley Locklear. I'm a second grade teacher at East Robinson. I um, want to talk about a couple of things. I'll first start talking about our Eureka Math. I personally used Eureka Math last year myself. It was a free version. Um, when I was in second grade teaching, the students last year, they were you know, from COVID, they were behind, especially they you know, couldn't read. And I wanted a math program that could reach those learners. So that's why I chose that last year. So I was already familiar with those strategies. It really helped them grow. Even my students that even might have had some learning disabilities, they were still able to um, answer some math questions, add and subtract in two and three digit numbers based on using place value method, the chip method, several different strategies that we have available. And I thought that that was amazing. So I um, just want to let you know that I am all for you with the math. So some things that I do in my classroom and also our team does before the lesson, we look at we look ahead at the lesson. We go ahead and look at the strategies. We look at the terminology. For instance, that so there is a terminology called compensation. A second grader is not going to know what that is. So we come up with friendly terminology. Okay, compensation means make a friendly number. So we look at that ahead of um, before we teach the lesson. It's something that you just can't open your math book up the day of the lesson and say I'm going to teach. I mean, it is literally strategic and you have to look ahead. So that's what we do in our common planning meetings. We go ahead and look ahead for the whole module assessment. We look ahead for the topic tickets, okay? We also um, look at the topic strategies. So teachers get together, we come up with these anchor charts that we go ahead and pre-make and it has steps listed. So we'll have like step one, this is what you do. Step two, this is what you do. And it has actually the whole strategy. So in class, we'll make an anchor chart with the, with the students, and this is what they refer to for that lesson. So when we're doing a lesson, um, it, when they're doing the independent practice, they can refer to the anchor chart, go to step one, step two, step three, and they know exactly what to do, okay? Um, during our lessons, during the launch portion, um, we'll use the anchor charts as strategies, we'll guide them step by step. So we will do problems with them, then we'll do start our independent. Now independent, that's where we'll provide the real lifetime feedback. So I'll go, okay, this is step one, everybody do step one. So I'll walk around the class, we have um, what's called like our data tracker, we'll check and see, okay, who's um, having issues with step one. We'll go ahead and provide live feedback right then. Okay, well, you're not carrying this number or this is what you're doing. So that'll help us correct the issues before they even get to their exit tickets. So it's all about getting those, um, finding the issues there in live time with the child before just having them on get into the exit tickets and saying, okay, you got the problem wrong, but why did you get it wrong? So I want to find out beforehand exactly what's going on. Okay, um, after that, we have a data tracker that we have, we track throughout the lessons every day. That's for our exit tickets. After that, we pull those students during intervention time or directly after the math lesson and we'll work with those students. Okay, we might have five or six students that need extra time. I'll reiterate those um, lessons, we'll go step by step. Or we can also pull the old Eureka math lessons. It has the same modules, the same thing aligned. So that's some things that we do. We also use the module assessments and topic quizzes. So what we do is we, we look at that data as a team. It also can do that for you online when they do the online module. 
or if you just do the PDF version in the classroom. So we look at it and we'll see, okay, these students are not mastery. They're 29% or below. These students are developing 29 to 59%. These are approaching 60 to 79% and these students are mastery. So these same students, I'm seeing a trend. Okay, the past few exit tickets or topic quizzes, we have these group of students that are truly struggling. They're struggling with number sense. So we'll just come up with some ideas of how to pull those students up to get to where they need to be. Um, so that's how we truly use like our intervention time. Team Teach, um, directly after the MOY, we looked at all of our data for our EL and also our module two assessment. So our students were currently on module three for our, mat our math and they're doing great with that. Um, so when module four comes up, they'll be adding subtracting to a thousand. So we have been reteaching those um, module two in the afternoon for intervention time because some students struggle with adding, adding subtracting to 200. And we wanted to prepare them for when they come up to module four, which is gonna be adding subtracting to 1,000. So that's what we're doing as, as team teaching. Get into those, pulling those certain students as a whole. And if a, a teacher is um, more prominent or can, is, is better at teaching skills or is better at teaching math or strategies, we'll get them what they, they're based on, their, um, what they feel comfortable with and we'll pull those students out. Um, so what I feel like Eureka Math, some of their strengths is the daily drills that we do. So in order to really true see success, if a teacher teaches the, the lesson exactly how it is, don't skip the drills. The drills are really important for number sense, for them to understand. I know when I was in school, I remember I just was writing on a math problem, traditional algorithm, stacking problems. And I didn't really understand, okay, how many tens are in a hundred, how many, you know, ones, how many thousands, and we didn't do that. We just did a math problem. So this program actually helps them visually see and understand the value of numbers. Um, it really is going to, I, I can see true growth. Let's say if you have a child starts kindergarten, first grade, with this program, it moves on up to by the time they get to high school, I think they'll be truly set up for success um, as, as a whole. Um, so we also use the manipulatives that she said every one of us got. We did get those kits for the manipulatives. We use the whiteboards. Our tier three students, the students that we see, okay, this is happening every day or every week on these topic tickets, they're really struggling. That's where we pull those extra resources. We can either pull, um, we have availability where we can go to like first grade or you can go to a higher grade if you want to challenge students. You can and go and pull those extra resources and print those math resources based on the module. So we do have access to that um, to either challenge students or help anyone else um, if we want to do that. Now, are um, anybody have any questions on the math before I go to skills? Excuse me, Mr. Brewer. I will say that um, I had to uh, a grand opportunity to sit in on Miss Ashley's class at East Robinson. And I had the opportunity to ask her some questions about the style of teaching in the curriculum. And uh, she was one of the, one of the teachers that helped me understand the new process, our new curriculum process. Mm -hmm. And she did an awesome job. And uh, I'm just glad we got you here tonight to go through the process to share this with everybody because you made it simple. You made it real easy for me that day. And um, I got a granddaughter in second grade. And uh, she tells me, don't, they don't, we don't, we don't do math like you used to do it. So, you know, you, you taught me in a way that I could understand and, and, and uh, I could talk with her, her language. Thank but, you. Uh, but, you know, I also, in, in defense to Dr. Williamson, uh, incorporating PLCs with principles and and uh, uh, the the levels of of you know the, the different grade levels with the group of teachers I think is awesome I, I got to sit on several of those that is that is what we need to be doing more of appreciate you yes we really appreciate that extra planning time that we have that gives us time to get together as a team and look over our data and see exactly what we need and also one thing I thought about I know that um, the old Eureka um, has videos and that's something that we I like to link my parents to those videos if there's some lessons like let's say add a subtracting to a thousand we have strategies that they're not familiar with like make a 10 or compensation or add and subtract on a benchmark number I will go find those videos and that's sometimes 
if another teacher isn't familiar with that, this might be hard for them to do, but we'll find those videos, send it to the parents, and that helps them with the homework. So that's something that we can do across, you know, that can be done across the board to help these parents with the homework because that can be a struggle for parents. Um, now, skills group, that this is something that I truly love. I love phonics. I love math, but I really love phonics. I love teaching kids how to read. Um, we have a children, the state of North Carolina itself, or just all across the, the United States, children are struggling to read. And the reason why is because there's, well, first of all, you know, the pandemic, and there's 26 letters, there's 44 sounds, but there is 144 graphemes. Graphemes are ways to spell those words. So it can be truly challenging for some people, some students. It can also be challenging for some people to learn how to teach it. That's why we have a state program now that teachers are required to learn how to teach phonics with letters. So um, I really love EL skills. Now, when I first started, I had already used Letterland last year and I used Hooked on Phonics and my kids grew tremendously. Now, it was hard for me to change at first because I wasn't familiar with the program. So I'm not gonna say I started off loving it. I was, it was overwhelming at first. But when I really got into it, my children have really grown tremendously this year. Matter of fact, I have my data. We do a data sheet, we're really extra at East Robinson, but <laughs> we have our data and I'm gonna go over some, some students here. So like for instance, we had a large number of students that were, were in the kindergarten stage. Okay, now we have a large amount of students that are in second grade stage and this data aligns with M-class data. So what these skills do is it focuses on the skill of the child, the sound that they aren't familiar with, okay? So when you do a, a whole group teaching, you're teaching as a whole, you're not reaching each level of each child what skill that they need to work on. Also, we have a student, she's an ESL student. Last year, she was in a tier, had a tier three folder, okay? We got rid of that this December because that student from the letters curriculum. Um, also, um, we have extra supplemental material because the curriculum does come with one decodable, and I think it's very important to have several decodables, like Charlotte Mecklenburg, they might have 10 decodables per cycle. So I think it's really important to implement extra decodables and um, roll and reads, which are words that they can read based on the phonics skill. Um, because if you have one decodable and you just read that same decodable five times a day, you're gonna memorize that by the end of the week. So that doesn't show true mastery. How we show true mastery is that we, you can read several different new decodables or passages, and if you can read that, then that lets me know that you have mastered that skill and you can move on you know, to the next level or next skill. So those are some things that we do in our group. Also by microphase, we like to group them and we use some of the same strategies as Charlotte Mecklenburg. We like to group them by different times how, mu how much we see them. So if a child is on second grade level, right? Um, we would only um, need to see them one or two times a week in their small group because they can work more independently in their own group, okay, for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now, if a child is way below, let's say kindergarten or first grade reading level, we'll see them every day for about 30 to 40 minutes because we do have an hour. We have 15 minutes of um, whole group instruction and then 45 minutes that we'll see um, all the other children. Now, does every child need to be seen 30 minutes at a time every day? No. Because our high ones, they're more advanced. They can do independent work. That's what we um, set up our cycles for, our um, skills block. But the ones that really need that tier three instruction, those are the ones that we need to be seeing at the teacher table. And that's how we base our cycles, is on those microphases. And for the EL whole block, um, some things that we do is we, my children, and what I really love this year, I've never seen before, is that they really love what they're reading. They're going to the library, they're getting books that, like right now we're reading on um, fossils and paleontologists. Every week they're getting a book with about fossils and paleontologists and they're really excited about that. So 
that makes me excited because last year they didn't do that. So now they really love what they, they're reading. And they're really, it's, it's almost like a hook and reel, like we talked about. We're hooking them in. So if we can get those kid, like scientist kids, maybe some um, like a fossil dig or something, that would be great next year. But the kids really love what they're reading. And so I really appreciate that. Overall, I think the all programs, the Eureka and um, the EL are great. And I've seen a lot of growth, not throughout just my class, but throughout my second grade team. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? I don't <clears throat> I have a question. I have a comment. I know you, you're working and you've heard all the positives and you've heard all the negatives. Yes, ma'am. How do you deal with someone that comes to you and obviously you're not that person that's burnt out and says, I've had enough of this. I can't teach math and reading. I, I don't like the program at all. How do you approach that? If you well, have a comrade or someone working with you with that, that's at that state. Now, um, it really does matter, the team that you're working with. Now, um, I can, like I said, um, when we first started, all the <coughs> curriculums were a little bit overwhelming. Also, with letters training, we had a lot thrown at us at one time. But um, as a lot of teachers have grown in and learned to love and embrace, now if a teacher is struggling, what you could do is pair them with someone with like a master teacher or someone that's more comfortable with the curriculum, maybe just to guide them along the way to show, okay, this is how we can make this a little bit better. Let me see your data. Let's pull, let's get together. And honestly, there's only there's some small things that you can do to really improve um, um their day like team teach for instance that's something that you can do there's a lot of resources you know that we have we have um uh, it's called like a, a cycle sheet per cycle so we know exactly the the skill that we're teaching um and we have that from kindergarten all the way um to second and we share that throughout our whole school so that's something that we like to do um but those are some things that you can do i would say definitely from a teacher's perspective get a teacher maybe at that school or maybe at another school and and to team teach and show them exactly this is what we do because I think as a whole uh, we need to work together as a team and what I do like about having the same curriculum throughout the county if I have a child that's transferred let's say from one, another school and they come to me that we're all on the same page you have been exposed to those same skills those same math strategies um, I, we really don't have to you know push and dig and try to get you to where you need to be because you have been exposed to that. So that's what I really like because before, um, you know, we did have students that were never, never exposed to these like phonics skills or these different math strategies and things like that. So I like being on the, the same page and as, as far as the county. Thank you so much. Any comments, Mr. Brewer? I got a question, Ms. Ashley, um, and not just to target you or your class, but, um, how do you work with, do you have parent interaction that uh, ask you, uh, can you give them assistance? And if you do, how, how do you, or when do you go about taking care of that process? You, you said a parent? Yes. Yes. So like I said, for my math, I like to send videos to my parents to let them know if there's, if I know there's a strategy they might be struggling with, I'll go ahead and send them that video. Also, I've actually had parents call me and say, okay, we're struggling with this phonics skill. I've been on the phone FaceTiming with them, literally, beauty shop, no lie, teaching that phonics skill. But that's a little overboard, but that's me. But um, you can, a teacher can send, communicate through, um, I would say, Class Dojo or Remind. They can send a, like a, a video. Um, we, those cycles actually also have a teaching lesson that you can send to parents. And I like to send that to my parents also. So we do have the resource available, like in the cycle, the cycle lessons. Um, the math lessons, you can send those directly to parents if they want to become from, more familiar with that, if they're struggling at that time. Thank you. Any more comments, Mr. Turner? This question may, may or may not be for you, but you said something that caused me to, to think about something. Um, you, were, you mentioned um, if you have a student that transfers to your school, uh, if you know from another school that, that they're on the same, um, you, you know exactly where they are, but you know, based on our uh, pacing guides that was the case before i mean the, the curriculum doesn't really have an impact on that i mean we used pacing guides before we had the new curriculum right we yeah. did okay well that's true but some schools use different books like for instance some use my math some used uh what was it before there was different 
um, HMH, everyone did not use the same curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they taught different strategies, different things. So I like the fact that is, it is, even though we do have a pacing guide, yes, but there, this is the same curriculum that they have been exposed to. It's all unified, unison. Do we have a countywide policy or procedure on how um, on how teachers uh, utilize or, or leverage a uh, power school? Because what I'm hearing from some parents is, if if grades aren't updated, they'll show up as zeros, and then you know uh, a student may uh, or a teacher may be behind on grading, and I guess by default it shows up as a zero, and then all of a sudden um, they may have an if. Uh, today and two days later they got a B or whatever and it can make it challenging for, for parents to, to help students you know with their homework if they can't really gauge exactly where they are so do we have a, a countywide uh, policy or procedure or suggestion on how we leverage power school because I feel like if you're halfway leveraging it if you're halfway using it and students grades are showing up as if you you're better off not to even start using it if that's an option Uh, I can answer from way back. I, I can't remember now because I, I do know I attended the policy committee meeting when they were working on it. There used to be a bottom grade you give a child because the child, I think it was a 50, if the child, you know, took a turn for the best, then there was a chance the child could make it up and pass. But if you give a child a zero, is that what you're referring to in power school? It, based on my understanding, by default, assignments shows uh, show as zeros if they're ungraded. I don't wait not, a minute. Okay, wait a minute. So this, this gentleman is. Would you respond, sir? You you seem to know what's going on. It's Mr. Singletary. Sinclair, Mr. Sinclair. I called you Singletary, but they were good people too, okay? <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yes. Oh. Okay, let me repeat what Miss Nikki just said because she's not in a microphone. So she said that if they're utilizing Canvas, and I know Canvas very well, and this is exactly this is true, um, unless you go into the settings and change it, it's going to show up as a zero, and that zero is going to be part of your weighted total. So what I'm hearing is parents going in and checking Power School, and one day it's an F, and two days later it's a B, and and these assignments are, you know, maybe it may sit as a zero for several weeks. I guess that's something that the staff here would have to check into and see how it's handled. I, I can't answer that, I don't know. Mr. Brewer? Dr. Emanuel, I'm on the policy committee and I do recall us having discussion about that same yes. concern you brought up. Um, we don't want to jeopardize a student and give them something that they can't make up because it's not encouraging, influencing the student to give it all in all. It may be that you, the first semester, the student just chooses not to do well. But if you show, if you, if you give them a zero, then they can't, or if, even if they made a hundred on the second, you're looking at what, 50%. So that's going to discourage that student. So we're not helping the student in that fashion. So I, I understand we, Mr. Bobby, I'm not sure which policy it was, but I do remember us discussing that, discussing that in the policy. And um, we could, maybe we could, at the board, the next board meeting, mm -hmm. we can have that policy. Well, well, there's a policy meeting Thursday. Day pardon. Yeah, clarify, Bob. Mr. Bobby. All right, so uh, we do have a grading floor and it is that of a 50. That grading floor only applies to nine week grades and final grades. 
So if I do, if let's say there is an assignment and I do not turn it in, I will get an I will get a zero. But the grade that will be reflected on my report card cannot be lower than a fifty. Mr. Terry, is that clear? My, my question is about student support. By the time they get their, their report card, you know, that's, that's a little bit late. So I, I'm thinking about, you know, within this nine week period, if you've got a grade that's not, um, if, if parents have access to a grade that's not accurate, they're, they're not gonna be able to support, to support their, their child in, you know, in, a, in an efficient manner. So that's was, you know, going back to my earlier point, I feel like if, if we're not on top of making sure these, these grades are updated in our systems and parents have up the most updated information, we're better off not to even use it. Or we're better off, we, well, we need to find a better solution. And, and, I'm, and I know that this varies by school and by teacher and, and everything, but this is, this is affecting people, uh, parents that, that we're asking to, to help your child with such and such. So we need to kind of rethink um, our processes and make sure that everybody's on the same page and has access to the most um, up-to-date information countywide. Well, I think that's something that the administration should address with principals, make sure your teachers are keeping accurate, updated grades on kids, be it in whatever, I mean. Yeah, it's one of our takeaways, we're looking and Clarify. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any more comments? Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. If I had a little girl, a little boy, I would put them in your class or ask that they be put in your class. Unfortunately, those days are gone. What were you saying? Yeah. Well, you yeah, put yours in there too, would you? Okay. <laughs> but I thought you were saying that. I was too old. So I'm going to let Kim Demery, she's the academic coach at Pembroke Elementary, um, speak to us about how she provides support and also what the differences are that she sees in the school. I'm sorry, there was no microphone and I didn't get the name. Kimberly Demery. Okay. Academic coach at Pembroke Elementary. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to speak on behalf of the work that we're actually doing in the school and to share with you things that we're doing with teachers to support them with the new implementation. I will say at the very beginning, it was overwhelming. Um, but I, what I seen teachers being more overwhelmed with was all the resources that were provided. Um, this is my 19th year in education, second year as an academic coach, and never have I seen a curriculum that provides everything that a teacher needs. Um, it was a lot to go through for them. But like Dr. Carr said, academic coaches receive monthly professional development. In turn, after I receive the professional development, I take that back to my teachers during POC meetings. We provide them with everything that we've learned, updates. It allows time for us to clear up any misconceptions that teachers may have. I also allow this time for teachers to ask questions during POCs. So if I'm not able to answer them the next time I have training, that's something that I can ask um, during our professional developments. During PLCs, we have worked on actually helping teachers internalizing the lesson plans because teachers are so used to actually having to create the lesson plans, the lesson plans are done for them. So they had to learn how do I plan when the planning's already done for me. So we walked through that with them. We've also looked at each module for EO and Eureka and determine, you know, what is the overview? Why am I teaching this at this point in the year? Because that has came up during PLCs, you know, well, I'm used to teaching this um, particular concept this time of the year. So the curriculum provides that for the teachers to explain to them why we're teaching it, why are the strategies we're using. Um, we have spent time looking at the assessments and helping teachers understand how to score them and how to use that data to plan instruction. Um, during PLCs, we do have it set up as a, as a training, but with myself and the principal, we are really trying to do the work that the teachers are doing to let them know how involved that we are in this because we don't want them to see us as just telling them what's expected. We wanna walk them through it. 
So for example, with the scoring of skills block, before we met, I actually gathered all assessments from a class and I walked myself through it to make sure I understood how to support them. And that made a huge difference on under them understanding how to actually group those kids into the microphase like Ms. Ashley mentioned, so they can provide that um, with them. I also make myself available at all times. When I first come in in the morning, I always do a walk through the school while the teachers are um, greeting students at the door. That gives them an opportunity to ask a quick question. I can answer. If I don't know, I'll get back with them. So I always make myself available for them to ask questions. Um, we also have created, or not created, but set up four planning days for teachers this year. So with the budget, we have allotted four days where teachers will be outside of the classroom and they'll get to plan all day so we'll be provided during our planning days, we're really gonna focus on them looking at the data and planning instruction, but also focus on the curriculum. Like for example, our first planning day with walkthroughs, we noticed a trend that teachers were struggling with skills blocking all block, which is the second hour of our EL, um, EL um, block. So what we did, we took that time to train teachers and help them to understand what the purpose of skills block is in all block and walk them through and planning out a whole week and what it should look like. That has made a big difference. Um, is everything perfect? No, but it's a work in progress and we're moving forward and that's, that's what matters at this point. Um, we don't expect teachers to be perfect. We tell them we're learning with them. Um, and I can see the difference, the impact I've shared and Ms. Hunt and I have talked about the work that we did last year. So last year when we started relay training, one of the protocol was that you went back and made sure teachers understood the standards. So we did a know and show chart. We quickly realized that there were some misconceptions on what teachers were expected to teach. I'll give you an example. Um, one was place value. So the standard was adding and subtracting and using place value strategies. Teachers were teaching the kids how to do standard algorithm when that wasn't a skill that wasn't supposed to be taught to a third grade. And so that's when we really realized that the instruction that was being provided did not align with the standard. This curriculum is doing the work for the teachers. They're not having to figure out what's expected with the standards because everything is laid out for them. Um, has been a big difference um, from what I can see, huge impact as far as making sure that the instruction is provided is aligning with the standard. I know there's um, negative comments, I guess, towards the math because of the strategies that's been used. But when you look at the unpacking documents, the strategies that's in Eureka is very similar to what's in the unpacking documents. And teachers were missing those strategies. They were not utilizing them. This curriculum is allowing them to teach it and use the strategies that should be expected by the state. Um, so I really think the curriculum has made a difference as far as making sure that instruction that we are providing is aligning with the standard and it's complex. It's really um, meeting the needs of our students. Any questions? Any, I just, anyone have any comments? I, I just want to ask the question, have you had opportunities to actually, excuse me, have to teach a class to show the teacher how? I haven't had the opportunity to actually teach. Um, from my perspective, I think co-teaching is better than me going over it, going in and taking over and teach that class. Last year I did, I went into classes and modeled teaching a lesson. This year, we've tried to work on going into a classroom, observing and providing real-time feedback right then and there. I think that's more effective from what I've seen to me going in and teaching a lesson. Because if I go in and teach a lesson, that teacher's going to understand that lesson for that day. But tomorrow, she's going to be in the same situation that she was before I modeled that lesson because each lesson is going to be different. So I think the real-time feedback has been beneficial for us because we can go in look at the lesson um, and provide feedback, that teacher can fix it right then and move forward. Thank you, oh, sorry, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Ms. Kim. I just got one quick question. Um, as, an, as an academic coach, 
um, and I'd like to get your perspective on this. When we started this curriculum and we, and we went into the discussion about the, um, the scripts, I had some um, reservations about, um, you know, using a, a, a script. Um, and and I, I understand the advantages of it to establish that common language. And that, that's important. I do understand that. But what is your strategy for a teacher that may be struggling uh, with the script and finding a balance between um, how uh, how uh, words or how the language is um, projected through the script versus how um, our student population um, best understands the you know the content? So there's got to be some there has to be some balance between the script and and in our particular population. So how do you support a teacher that's having um, struggling finding that balance? Well, I think the script, the script that's provided is wonderful, especially for our VTs, our vacuuming teachers, and even some of the veteran teachers, they need that support. Um, we have told to not gear off as much as possible from the strip, but there are times when they're gonna have to break it down. I, my recommendation is that they still use the terms that's in the script that's provided, but then as a teacher, then you know, how can I say this a little different so they can understand what I'm seeing? Does that make sense? So when we go in to provide feedback, if a teacher is not saying word from word, nobody's gonna be, we don't ridicule them for doing that, as long as they're still on the same topic and they're still providing that rigor and complex that the lesson is provided. Any more questions? Yeah, I agree. Because inside the lesson, it like Miss Sneaky Umbrook stated, it does tell you additional support that may be needed that you can reword things. I would just add to that: we have not taken away the teachers' creativity in terms of how they deliver, and that's an important point. So, but. and we've talked about when they internalize the lesson. Um, while you're internalizing it, you should be thinking about how am I going to scaffold this to meet the needs of my students? Um, and that, that's going to go into that play. Are you going to have to reword things or, you know, provide that additional support that's needed? Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Demery. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Uh, Good evening. Um, if anyone knows me, I love curriculum. It's probably one of my favorite things to, um, to talk about. And getting a new curriculum, I was excited at the beginning of the year. I was nervous because I knew what all it entailed. I also know that teachers have a hard time with change, and I have a hard time with change. Change is hard. Um, but I also want to be prepared to be able to support them in any way that I could throughout the year. And therefore, I started doing my own research. I called around. I've done my own digging. But I will tell you, from August until now, it's a whole different world within our buildings. The reading, the writing, the conversations, the discourse, every bit of it is a whole lot different than what it was in August till now. Are there, there's some parts that we still need to work on? Yes, nothing's perfect. And I said this to Dr. Carr the other day, maybe two to three years, we will be smooth running. But throughout the next two to three years, if we really put in the work, you're going to see a huge difference in Robinson County. But this program is going to help us get there. The writing, second graders today talk about fossilization and um, paleontologists. I can tell you those weren't words I was spilling in second grade. Kindergarten, go and talk to a kindergarten teacher and listen to them express what their children are writing about, walk in the room and writing in kindergarten in January. They were writing the room in uh, November. Most of the time they weren't doing that. So there's huge changes going on our campus. Second graders are writing paragraphs, fifth graders are writing essays. 
And that is one thing that I have taught about getting writing in back into our schools since I was at Deep Branch. So we're moving in the right direction. We gotta provide support, we gotta be patient, but I really think this is the way we need to go. And I am enjoying it. Um, I enjoy watching the kids read. I enjoy listening to the kids talk. Uh, we went into a classroom last week and the kids had a book on frogs. And it was a glass frog and you could see the heart beating. I'd never seen that before. But the looks on the kids' eyes as they're reading these materials, their eyes just light up. So if you have a chance, come and visit. Walk through the doors, listen to the conversations of the kids. You will be impressed. Any questions? Ms. Stein. Let me clarify that I was, a, um, with my earlier comment about, um, you know, about the language and trying to find that, that balance. Let me clarify that I wasn't trying to sound like I, you know, that, that our teachers aren't qualified or anything. I just want to make sure that that message is clear. Um, I think uh, some of the, the challenges and some of the, especially from the teachers, you know, we, we do, we're here with some, some of the teachers that I've talked with, they, they've have, they're having some they're not in all in favor of, of the, the curriculum, especially at the beginning. And I think I think part of that had to, had to do with our implementation. And it's the way we it's the way we approach you know approach individuals. I think us from the um, from the, the board level, from the district level, we need to be um, uh, we need to be a little bit more um, strategic in the way we address individuals. I mean, these are we're talking about people that, with the college degrees, um, master's degrees, doctoral degrees. Um, we don't want to approach them in such a way that that, that we're this is what we're going to do. It was just in my mind, and based on feedback that I've heard, it was just kind of um, sprung on people at the last minute. And I mean, it sounds like for the 90%, you know, 95% of the individuals it's working well, but the implementation um, in the beginning, I think, is, is, what, is where we missed the mark. And I've, I've talked um, in the last couple of meetings about, um, uh, about um, partnerships and about shared governance. And when I say shared governance, I'm not talking about three or four people that's handpicked or sitting around the table deciding exactly what's going to happen throughout the entire district. We've got to have um, we've got to ensure that we, we do a better job of, um, of ensuring that we have uh, immediate and um, candid and welcoming shared governance throughout the process, throughout the entire process. And I'm not saying that we're going to get 100% of, of teachers or 100% of everybody on the same page, but we've got to do a better job of making people feel like they were included in the discussion. Thank you. And let me say, by the way, um, with all due respect, Dr. Emanuel, I think we need to we need to get on a schedule with these curriculum committee meetings. I think we need to have them a little bit more often every other month or, or whatever. Um, so so we don't feel, you know, a little you know, rushed when we have these these conversations, because this is a this is an important an important committee. It's vital. I, I apologize. Have I made you feel rushed tonight? <laughs> well, I, I apologize if I've made you feel rushed tonight. I, I, I really am. I'm sorry. Uh, Let and me I, add I, one more thing. One yes, of the things that I've seen is the kids reading. Um, going, just going to the buses, the kids have books in their hands, and that's something that I hadn't seen in a long time. Seeing kids really engaged in reading, and sometimes I even open the book and say, tell me what happened on this page, and they can tell me what happened, because sometimes they have a bookmark just to put it there. Their bookmarks aren't just there anymore. They're re really where they're reading at. They do. Thank you, Ms. Sneaky. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Oh, oh, we got another one? Oh, I'm so sorry. I saved the best for the last dinner. Um, so I'm the principal at St. Paul's Middle. So from that middle school perspective, a um, couple of different things. 
Um, first, to talk about this year, we had to staff our schools with some international teachers for the first time in a long time. Uh, with me having nine, it was a lot easier for me to give them the support that they needed because we had a constant curriculum across um, the entire building. And it wasn't just depending on the teachers to guide them on what they needed to do. Myself, the rest of my instructional leadership team could help them. Um, the other perspective is, is that it, it was a struggle for most of our teachers, right, at the beginning. And it was a struggle based on the fact that it wasn't what they were used to. And once they started diving into it, it became a lot easier for them. And so now we don't, I don't hear any conversations about they're making us read this, they're making us read that, all these different things, because now they see what that led their students to do. The students are having conversations, like they mentioned, conversations that they normally would not have about the text. Um, my seventh graders right now just finished up writing a novel um, in class, and they did it as a group where they had to communicate and they had to talk about the different elements. And while some of our teachers in the district before this curriculum might have had that idea, might have pushed their students to that level, all of our teachers were not. In the previous position that I held, um, going around to the different schools, you didn't know how to support their schools because they did not have the same curriculum. They had different things going on. Now it, it makes it easier for even the district to provide the support and for us as principals to look and say, okay, this is where they're supposed to be. I can easily assess what their lesson plan is, pinpoint where they're at, and then kind of support them that way. The last thing is the alignment with everything. Earlier we mentioned Relay and how it played into it. Um, last year I was part of the first cohort of Relay. And when I came in and we got the relay processes and we were looking at it, it was a little difficult to try to do those. This actually made relay a little bit easier for us because now when we're going in, we know what to look for. Some of those same practices are embedded within the curriculum. As far as the student collaboration, them being able to turn and talk, that same vocabulary popped up in the curriculum as it was in the relay. So there is some alignment with everything that we're doing and we don't have four or five different things going on that just does not align with each other. So it, it made it easier for us as instructional leader in the building, as the principal, to be able to support our teachers and give them everything that they need. All right. Tell me, what is the most enjoyable thing that you find being a principal? For me, I think it's, it's the students, whenever they get something and they're happy to tell you about it. Um, and so I think that was the biggest thing. And that's really like I know about the seventh grade novels because a kid was excited to bring it to me. I walked into a class when they were walking. I was like, OK, well, I'm interested to see that when it's finished and everything else. And they brought it to the office to actually show it to me. And so for them to kind of do that part, like that makes me feel like I had an impact on you. What I said to you mattered. What you're doing in class matters. What you're doing in the school matters. I don't know. It's just an enjoyable life. Middle school, if you haven't worked at a middle school before, you're missing it. <laughs> you talking about between eight to three or you talking about after three? <laughs> um, no, no. I'm just saying middle school is a is the life to go if you want to be in education. <laughs> I tell you what, the, big, the biggest thing that I've found that people work in middle school, they develop a sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> to keep their sanity. You have to. You have to. Yeah, too. But, but I, I love my kids. I love the staff. I love the things that we're doing. Um, and then I love the growth that we've just made as far as what our classes look like every day when we walk into them. Appreciate that. I appreciate your vantage point, too. Any more comments, Ms. Brewer? I'd like to say uh, appreciate you, Dr. Sinclair. I uh, had the opportunity to sit in with him on PLCs. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was that uh, most of, not most, but to say part of his teachers were substitutes. Wow. And I couldn't distinguish the difference between a certified teacher and a substitute. They were all getting the same information, same time, led by Dr. Sinclair, doing an awesome job. Um, that, as a board member, it made me feel comfortable that you know, whether we got a certified teacher there or not, those students are getting the same information of equal value in each classroom. And they, and, and it, it was apparent that they um, weren't afraid to speak up, tell what was, 
what they were thinking and also the overlap and teachers would say, hey, I need help with this or I need help with that. And I heard some others echo the same thing. And I think that teamwork atmosphere is what we're developing now that we've never had before. We work more independently before. So I think that's an asset for us in Robinson County. And again, thanks. And that's another perspective as well with the substitutes. Um, I've been blessed to have a couple of really good long-term substitutes. Um, but one in particular, if you walked in her fifth grade math class, you could not tell she wasn't a teacher. That's right. Um, but the curriculum allowed her to do that because yeah. she has the same things going on. She has the same resources as everybody else, so you can't tell the difference. Exactly. And she said she loved it. Right. Thank you so, so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Um, like I said, we have two actual committee members here, but we appreciate the input from all the other board members. I'm, we appreciate you being here. Now, do any board members have anything else you would like to address dealing with the curriculum? We'll do our best with all these experts here to address it. Please, please feel free, Mr. Brewer. Dr. Emanuel, if there's no other comments or questions or concerns at this time, I would like to make a motion that we dismiss. Anybody object? You're gonna cry if we're dismissed. Okay, I do want to tell you what's gonna happen with all this material. In discussion with the superintendent, I'm sure you will agree that we can't, with all the other business that's going on, we, we can't discuss in length all these at the board meeting, but what we're going to do with all of these, and if we're gonna put it as information in the pack at the regular board meeting. So all of this information will be shared with all the board members. Now, I'm not sure whether we will share the, just as re-information, the new career center programs. I'm not sure if that will be shared, but all of this will be in the board pack. So without any objections from anyone, I will second and third that uh, motion by Mr. Brewer. So good night, everyone.